I'm going to sit on a stool if that's all right. Sure. Uh, see if the slide. The slide's right, right behind you on the floor. Okay. My name is Fred Corley, and I'm, uh, I'm with the Department of Orthopedics here. I grew up in a, in fact, when I was talking to my geriatric mother on the phone, I was, I didn't know what group I was going to uh, visit with, so I asked her some questions. <laughs> she uh, told me that uh, geriatric bones are much more painful than adolescents were. But I grew up in a small town in uh, Mississippi. The uh, town is called Yazoo City. And it was uh, sort of a rural setting. <clears throat> the last time I was home, my mother was still throwing out some of the uh, debris. I was the youngest child <clears throat> that I'd collected as a boy. And most of it had to do with uh, some sort of varmint or varmint skeletons. And so I had an interest in uh, skeleton from an early age. They, I went to England to school uh, after I finished college and then uh, <clears throat> after medical school, my, uh, actually my first, uh, my last year in medical school, there was a, a wonderful physiologist at Ole Miss uh, uh, named Arthur Guyton who, uh, <clears throat> You took physiology your second semester of your first year, and I was the class uh, president. So after the first quiz, and this was during the Vietnamese War, there were lots of folks that failed. So I was selected to go and talk with Dr. Guyton about uh, the uh, uh, quiz being too hard. And I went in there to talk with him about it, and he said, uh, <clears throat> Son, it's either my way or the highway. <laughs> he said, you learn, you learn physiology our way or you leave. <laughs> and uh, so I got to be a good friend of his from then on because I was always pleading the case of our guys. But I went back to England. Uh, he sent me back there my, all my senior year to take the, I had to take their quizzes and uh, <clears throat> take their final exams. And <clears throat> for some reason, I, I again uh, uh, was uh, assigned on my medicine rotation to a bone metabolism ward. And it was my job as a medical student, they had just started putting in um, hip replacements over there. It was my job as a medical student to, can you hear me? Okay. My job is, and stop me if I'm uh, uh, BSing too much, but it was my job as a medical student to <coughs> go harvest the hip replacements from people who had died. So if somebody had a hip replacement five years previously and died, the mortuary would call me, and that was my job. And we called it ash money because you made some money if you went over there because all of the, all of the uh, uh, most of the people that, were <clears throat> that died over there were cremated, which was quite foreign to us in Mississippi. We planted all of ours. I think they still do. But <clears throat> they... Uh, Again, I had to go to this to the mortuary, and I had to take the hip replacement out, and I had to uh, uh, <clears throat> see a lot of um, geriatric bony problems. And I had no idea how uh, indestructible bone was. Uh, the, uh, Dr. Calhoun, if somebody dies uh, after he does a heart transplant, they live for 10 years, and they die, and they bury them, and they go... <clears throat> somebody stumbles across their grave and digs it up uh, 150 years from now, that heart's going to be gone. But if I put a plate in and some peculiar angulation and the bone doesn't heal, that bone's still going to be there. So the, the skeleton has a, has a, has a long-term uh, survival uh, even after you die. Uh, and it's very important, especially important, while you're here living. The, there haven't been many things written about the skeleton. It's not I love you with all my femur or you're the apple, apple of my metatarsal. Uh, so there are a lot of other organs that are fairly transient that are, that are romanticized in the literature. Well, uh, after this uh, business in 
Britain again, I uh, uh, did a medicine internship in Dallas at Parkland. And those were the days, if you were born in 1948, uh, and the Vietnam War was still going on and you still had a draft number, they were going to grab you. So I then spent the next year after my internship, uh, after a medicine internship, they made me a class, whatever the lowest class surgeon was, because the lowest class surgeon went into the field. The upper class surgeon stayed at the base, so I was in the field taking care of uh, fractures and uh, uh, extremity wounds, and that's uh, engendered a, uh, what was a lifelong interest in uh, the skeleton and the musculoskeletal system. Now, that is a background. This is a, this is a thigh bone or a femur. This is the proximal end uh, or the head of the femur, and of course this is, uh, the head of the femur is referred to as the hip. The <coughs> pelvis or the acetabulum and I'm sure most of you know this, but I'm just uh, going over it again. Uh, you have a cup where the femur articulates with the pelvis. The fluted end of the bone, right here, uh, is called the metaphysis. The tubular part of the bone is called the diaphysis. And the distal portion of the fluted end of the bone is called the epiphysis. So you have diaphysis, metaphysis, epiphysis, DME. Uh, when I first did orthopedics, I could not remember varus from valgus, and I had a card, and I would look at it every day. Varus was bow leg, valgus was knock knee. So after several months, <coughs> uh, I remembered it, but you, you have diaphysis, metaphysis, and epiphysis. <coughs> the diaphysis, as you see, is built for strength or structure. Uh, for weight-bearing status. <clears throat> it's strong, it's tubular bone. Uh, when we fix a femur, <clears throat> the bone is hollow, and the diaphysis has to be reamed with uh, reamers. When you get into metaphyseal bone down here, the bone is a little thinner. It's more cancellous or marrowy bone, and uh, uh, it's not built as much for strength as the diaphysis is. The metaphysis is built for two things. Number one, it supports the growing part of the bone, which is the epiphysis. The bone grows from a small area of, of cells down here. This is a mature bone. This is not an uh, uh, adolescent. From the epiphyseal plate here, it grows uh, distally. And then you have a little growth up here. So most of the growth in height occurs in and around the knee joint. Uh, uh, distal femur, the proximal tibia, that's where the growing part of the bone occurs. But if you'll see how fluted the distal bone is, <coughs> it's that way for a purpose. The bone is cancellous, so it works as a shock absorber. You have a large uh, uh, joint surface here which uh, encourages uh, stability in the knee. If you had just a small point, you wouldn't have much uh, knee joint stability, so you've got a large surface area which uh, assures uh, knee joint stability. And in times of stress, if you have uh, some uh, uh, terrible disease where you lose some of the uh, marrow uh, producing capacity of your pelvis and of your sternum and of your ribs, uh, the bone, uh, the metaphyseal bone can actually start reproducing uh, red blood cells. <coughs> So this bone here, in addition to being an engineering marvel, uh, it, it's uh, your principal source of growth in height. It is a bank of a number of uh, very important minerals. Certainly number one is calcium, uh, phosphorus, uh, magnesium. Uh, it's a storehouse for uh, <clears throat> some of the uh, minerals that are essential for nerve conduction, uh, calcium and sodium. And if you have uh, diseases that influence the deposition of these uh, uh, elements, they will manifest themselves in, in skeletal lesions. So if you have something like uh, hyperparathyroidism, if you have a, uh, uh, somebody that has a hyperfunction of their parathyroid glands, they will often get uh, bone pain. They'll present to you with pain in the femur or pain in the, in the hand. You get an x-ray and you see where the 
some of the uh, cortical bone has been uh, destroyed or where there's some lysis of cortical bone. We're running into a, a number of problems, and I just got a call right before I came over here before. Uh, I have a wonderful patient that I've taken care of since I was a resident, so uh, uh, nearly 20 years, uh, in renal dialysis. Uh, <coughs> with dialysis, uh, uh, patients get uh, osteomalacia or adult rickets, and they have terrible problems with fractures. They have terrible problems with a lot of things, but uh, with uh, renal dialysis, they have a, a lot of problems with, with uh, fractures. Even moving them from the bed to the, to the dialysis unit, they can uh, crack a bone. Uh, fortunately, Mrs. Foote did not have a fracture, but I had promised her there is a place here in town where you can get peppermint candy called King Leo. And I promised her that I'd bring her some today, and I'd forgotten about it. So thank you all for having me for this lecture. <laughs> I will have to do it on Monday. Uh, <laughs> but uh, so, so the bone is a storehouse. In, in addition to being an organ, it is a tissue. So <clears throat> the, uh, the next time you hear about somebody fracturing a tibia, uh, think a little closer. It's not just lining it up and getting it to heal. Uh, the injuries that you can have to to uh, uh, bones in young adults are a little different than the injuries that you have in, in uh, older adults. Uh, the reason I'm saying all this without my slides on is because when the lights go down, <coughs> I wouldn't recognize you with your eyes open, so we'll <coughs> talk a bit and then I'll show you some slides and describe them. Most of, uh, of uh, the fractures that we see in an aging population are <coughs> Diaphysi uh, metaphyseal fractures because as you get osteoporosis or osteopenia, <coughs> most of the resorption occurs in the diaphyseal portion of the bone, not in the, I mean in the metaphyseal portion of the bone, not in the diaphysis. So hip fractures, uh, distal femur fractures, uh, fractures of the wrist are <coughs> quite common injuries in people that, uh, uh, as they grow older, for a couple of reasons, for several reasons, but uh, when you think about bony structure, that's the most vascular part of the bone, and that's where most of the osteopenia or the calcium resorption occurs. You, you still see fractures in the femur, but most of, in the diaphysis, but most of them are in the metaphyseal areas. Another problem is people get older, uh, they uh, lose some of their sense, uh, their proprioceptive senses, and they uh, fall more frequently. Uh, they don't uh, see as well, trip over uh, uh, rugs and things that they wouldn't do <coughs> 10 years ago. So fractured hips are very common things in uh, an aging population. Now, <clears throat> osteomyelitis in an aging population, is that a common thing? It, it is not a common occurrence, but it does occur. There are a number of reasons why this occurs. Number one, uh, Older people's immune system is not as uh, attuned to combating infections as uh, uh, younger folks are. Number two, they suffer a number of fractures, and some of these fractures have to be fixed. They have to be fixed because if they stay in bed, they may develop uh, pulmonary problems and they need to get up and get around. So anytime you operate, you <coughs> Uh, sacrifice some of the integrity of the skin, and that's the first barrier uh, to infection. So they have post-operative infection secondary to the fractures. With uh, people being active uh, into uh, fairly advanced years, uh, they are wearing out their joints uh, a bit more so than they did uh, uh, before. So joint replacement surgery, whether it be knee, hip, shoulder, elbow, is uh, a significant uh, uh, source of osteomyelitis, meaning infections, bony infections. This osteomyelitis uh, secondary to joint replacements, though it is a rare occurrence, it's less than 1% of the joints involved, uh, as they continue to, uh, to uh, build up becomes uh, quite a problem. 
the difficulties associated with osteomyelitis is once you get uh, osteo, it's very difficult to rid oneself of it. Uh, as the bone becomes infected, uh, though it has its own defense mechanism, uh, I've seen some children that had osteo as eight-year-olds, and I'll see at age 40 uh, with pain in their leg, and you'll get an x-ray, and there'll be a, a small abscess in there. So osteomyelitis is a long-term uh, uh, debilitating problem. Uh, and there are two peaks. You see it uh, in childhood and you see a smaller peak uh, uh, as uh, the population ages. Most common organisms, again, are staph, uh, both in childhood and in, uh, and in uh, adulthood. Uh, we see probably more gram negatives in uh, adults than we do in, in children. Uh, and the reason for this is uh, if you get a bacteremia with a, with a joint replacement, whoops, with a joint replacement or a, uh, whoops, or a uh, dental procedure, uh, often it will be a gram negative organism, mainly from the kidney. The third reason that you see a peak of uh, osteomyelitis in older uh, patients is that as people get older, there is an increase in the uh, uh, degenerative diseases of aging, not just arthritis, but uh, uh, you find more older people with uh, adult onset diabetes, uh, uh, with congestive heart failure, with a lot of things that decrease the body's response to any sort of insult. But the, the, the patients that alert you the most would be a 75-year-old woman that has a hip fracture, that has uh, diabetes, that's a bit overweight, that's in congestive failure. <coughs> Their incidence of infection following uh, uh, open reduction internal fixation of the hip fracture is five or six times what uh, a thin 75-year-old woman with no diabetes that doesn't smoke, that doesn't have uh, congestive heart failure is. So <clears throat> to emphasize again, the problems with osteomyelitis in an, in, a, in an older population are due to a number of things. One, <clears throat> their bones are brittle and they fracture, so they have to have, uh, the bones have to be fixed. Number Two, there is an increase in the uh, diseases of, uh, uh, that we associate with aging, specifically adult onset diabetes, congestive heart failure, uh, peripheral vascular disease. Uh, number three is uh, there's a decrease in the uh, immune response as people get older. Now, there are a number of exceptions to this rule. Uh, we found old people uh, that have no problems. I've got a mother that's 87 and a father that's uh, died at 85 that didn't seem to have any problems at all. <coughs> so, so, so it's not, it, it's not, uh, it's not a, uh, it's not uncommon to see uh, folks that uh, have lived uh, uh, or are blessed with good genes that don't have uh, the problems that uh, we associate with aging. Okay? See? Now, we can dim the lights, don't turn them off because I might snooze up here myself. <laughs> the metaphysics is usually where all the circulation in the bone is. Right? Not all of it, but, but, but a major portion of the, uh, of the uh, circulation is in the metaphysics. Because it's interesting how it is, it most of the uh, Osteomyelitis stars there, and then you said that this is where most of the fractures are too. That's right. That's right. Most of the fractures that we see are metaphyseal fractures, and if you section a femur, uh, most of the femoral fractures are spongy, uh, are spongial, are spongiosa bone, or uh, marrowy type bone like you see in the pelvis. Now this is a, as you can see, that this is a child's wrist. This is the growth plate here, this is the epiphysis, this is the metaphysis, this is the diaphysis here. So he's broken this bone and uh, that's uh, 
a few weeks later, and if you'll notice, uh, children's bone is very forgiving, especially in the areas where the blood supply is good. And children's bone, metaphyseal bone, uh, has a great deal of blood supply, so it has an enormous capacity to remodel. Up until about 12 or 13 years old, and that's when you become, uh, uh, the skeleton becomes more uh, adult in its response to injury, but you can see uh, how that, uh, all of the small bone down there is not, uh, is angulated, and all you have to do is give it a little time, and it usually uh, straightens out. So, <clears throat> fractures in, in uh, children that do not involve the growth plate, that do not uh, stunt growth, uh, uh, below the age of 12, nearly all do very, very well. This is the femur. This is a cross-section of the femur. And if you'll notice on this diagram here, you have lines of stress, and they correspond with the weight-bearing axis of the femur. And these lines of stress, you can see them here, trabeculae, as you grow older, uh, the number of trabeculae and the appearance on x-ray uh, can predict uh, hip fractures and what sort of fixation you will get uh, with a nail or a screw. So if you have uh, rotten wood, it's not going to hold a screw as well as a uh, fresh pine board would. So that's the problem with uh, aging and with fractures of the hip, with, fract with any fractures in the adult. If you don't have bone that's capable of holding uh, a screw or holding fixation, then you aren't going to get good fixation. And when you have an unstable fracture or one that doesn't, uh, uh, that you can't maintain good fixation on, uh, that increases the risk of infection. Now, again, as you age, this is female, this is male, <coughs> women have an increased uh, risk of uh, osteoporosis or, uh, than men do. And that has to do with a number of things. And there, there, there is no uh, good answer to this problem. We do know that women that have a number of children, uh, as a rule, have more problems with osteoporosis than women that don't. Women that smoke have more problems with osteoporosis than women that don't. Uh, the same is true for men as far as smoking and alcohol consumption are concerned. Uh, as you age, this is the age in years, up to 70, and this is the cross section of the femur. You can see that the femur uh, the canal or the, the circumference of the femur grows uh, significantly larger, but you will notice that the cortical bone, the cortical bone surrounding this canal thins. So at age 20, you have a good thick cortical bone with a canal, uh, uh, and at age 40, it's a little less, and at age 70, you have a big thickened, a, a large uh, circumference of your femur. Uh, with the cortical bone significantly thinned. The femur adapts to this because <clears throat> if you have, if, if your, your uh, rotational moment, the further your, the, the axis of rotation is from the center of the bone, the, more, the less susceptible it is to fracture. So the femur adapts to losing bone by growing bigger, by growing in, in circumference. Now, when do, when do people require uh, calcium? And this is a, this is a female. They require it uh, during their growth spurt, and they require more calcium as you age. Uh, they require it uh, during lactation and during pregnancy in women. So they were, their body needs for calcium increase significantly during lactation and during pregnancy. Uh, <coughs> And the body needs for calcium increase significantly after about 40. Well, well why do they do this? 
Number one, we don't absorb calcium after age 40 much, uh, as well as we did before. So <clears throat> the calcium requirements uh, increase because you need to take in more to absorb what you need. You pass a lot through the gut that does not absorb. Even with this, uh, you have some osteopenia. This is normal bone. The matrix of the bone or the base where the calcium is laid down is protein in nature. And it's called, uh, it's made up of uh, hyaluronic acid, uh, uh, collagen, uh, so, it's, so it's, a, it's a very strong uh, protein matrix. And then we deposit calcium in it uh, that gives it strength. <clears throat> this is normal bone, this is osteoporosis, so you see both uh, the protein matrix and the calcium is decreased. And this is with osteomalacia, or rickets. Rickets, <clears throat> you have an increase in the protein matrix and a decrease in the uh, organic, uh, the, the, the non-organic portion of the bone, the calcium hydroxyapatite. So these bones, though they are resilient, they are not as strong. This protein matrix gives you a lot of resilience. The, the, the uh, calcification is good for uh, weight-bearing stresses. <laughs> Again, uh, in England, I, I, I was in, uh, 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 over there, we, we forget how, how um, World War II affected uh, Great Britain. My dad went off to war and uh, left my mother with a bunch of house full of kids and then came back and I came along a few years later. Uh, but my dad came back. <clears throat> and in Britain, there was a whole generation of uh, women that husbands and sweethearts and boyfriends went off to war and did not come back. So, so there were, <clears throat> There, 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 there would be clinics of women in their 60s uh, that had not married uh, or had lost their husbands and had to raise children by themselves and uh, lived on fairly meager uh, earnings. And the sunlight over there uh, is not uh, what it is here. And you would see a lot of, of older women with the bowed legs probably secondary to osteomalacia. And it seems to affect women a, a bit more than men. This is, this is a typical picture of osteomalacia or rickets in a child. Uh, they get these, you notice the thickening here, they get uh, stress fractures because the bone is not as strong as it should be. This is <clears throat> what you see in uh, adults. They, they have uh, 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 their bone has a washed out appearance and they get stress fractures too. Stress fractures are due just to repeated uh, uh, stresses on a certain area of the bone. So the bone has to be pathologic. It's not normal bone. It gets repeated stresses which normal bone could uh, withstand, uh, but this bone fractures. So this is what you see in osteomalacia. I want you all to remember that verbatim. <laughs> This uh, is the bone of a, probably about a 35-year-old woman, non-smoker, non-drinker. This is the bone of a 35-year-old smoker, drinker that had had uh, six children. The uh, dark staining substance are calcified matrix. So you see how uh, osteoporosis uh, can be quite a factor in determining the stress of the bone. And you can get osteoporosis at a very young age uh, depending upon your lifestyle. This is what causes most of the fractures that you see uh, in older adults. Uh, again, men don't tend to get osteoporosis uh, as readily or as severe as women do. 
uh, and it usually occurs after, after uh, it always occurs after menopause. The GI tract, as we mentioned, does not absorb calcium uh, like it did before age uh, uh, 40. You have some kidney met metabolism that cuts down on the calcium absorbed or reabsorbed in the tubules. And uh, you have, whereas in uh, a good homeostatic young adult, formation and absorption of bone evens out. Uh, uh, as you grow older, you have more absorption than you have formation. Now, th th there is no, there is no one dead, uh, uh, certain good treatment for osteoporosis. <clears throat> the hormonal treatment for osteoporosis is uh, still sort of fraught with some question about whether, on the long term, uh, it's a good thing to uh, treat people with hormonal therapy. Uh, <clears throat> You do know that if you eat a regular diet, that if you get good exercise, if you don't smoke, and if you don't drink, that will help somebody with osteoporosis. What about preventing it? Probably won't prevent it, but it will uh, slow down the progression. And I have another question. In, in terms of uh, calcium supplementation, mm -hmm. what formulation of calcium seems to be most easily absorbed? I, I, I really can't tell you. Uh, it is simpler uh, to, you know, there are a number of calcium supplements that are on the market. Uh, if if uh, my mother talks to me about osteoporosis, uh, I will tell her that the collards and turnip greens that she eats every day are probably just as good as two rolls of Tums mm -hmm. or or, or whatever she's read about in Reader's Digest. Uh, <clears throat> so I think a healthy diet is probably the best thing. Now, can, can, you get enough, can you get enough calcium in a, in a healthy diet? I mean, like for instance, um, I don't take in like a lot of dairy products because I have a problem digesting them and I don't take uh, lactate and sure. anything like that. But, so I would imagine I would have a rather difficult time. I do exercise regularly. I do do uh, weight training and all that sort of thing. Um, I don't smoke. I drink a little bit socially. Um, I'm not a real big person, however, you know. So I know that my my risk factors are higher than someone who has a different type of skeleton than I do. But Trying to take calcium supplements, I have problems. Um, well, I guess I wouldn't say digesting them, but I have gastrointestinal distress. With sure. Uh, so, that—that's the—that's the usual complaint, and most of the people that that you suggest taking calcium supplements probably don't stay on them for a long period of time. And, and again, I don't think there's any good uh, uh, substitute uh, for, and, and, and not all your calcium comes from dairy products, but right. green leafy vegetables are probably as potent a source as anything. Broccoli, collards, uh, turnip greens, mustards, things like that. And I think the sweet potato is probably the world's most perfect food. It has everything in it. Corn tortillas. Oh, maybe corn tortillas. <laughs> and baby Ruth. Uh, baby Ruth, yeah. <laughs> now, but I don't think there is any tried, proven way uh, uh, to prevent osteoporosis uh, with, with uh, uh, hormonal and dietary therapy. But there are some ways that you can slow the progress down. So if I'm understanding what you're saying, it sounds rather inevitable. You are going to have some That's degree right. of this. So the best thing you can hope to do is uh, slow it down. That's right. I can remember I eat breakfast. I eat early every morning at Jim's restaurant. 
oatmeal, whole wheat toast, milk, coffee, and water. And I kept complaining about the light at the counter. And they kept telling me that, you know, we, we haven't changed the light at all. And I figured out that I needed bifocals. You know, it wasn't the light at all. So there, uh, uh, there's some things that you just have to adjust to, I think. And if you, if, you, if, you, if you live a reasonable life, then your chances are not as, unless there's some family history, are not as, uh, 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 are not as great as somebody that, that, that uh, uh, does not live a reasonable life. And for some reason, people, well, well, for known reasons, people that have a number of children uh, early on, uh, <clears throat> that really uh, saps the skeleton of, of stored uh, uh, nutrients. Whether you take calcium tablets or supplements or not, a lot of these calcium supplements that you take during pregnancy and during lactation, again, are not well absorbed. So are you talking about... say four, five children in your 20s or something? I think it, if you have your children before your skeleton's fully formed, if somebody uh, pre-18 has four children, well, they don't have the same skeletal maturity that somebody the age of 20 would have. Well, Lord bless their hearts, they've got a whole lot of problems. <laughs> That's right, well. <laughs> Now this is a hip fracture you see over there, and if you'll see, this is a uh, an older person with very big femoral canal. And the reason that you fix these hip fractures are number one, it decreases their pain, and number two, it lets them get up and get around. And so you fix it with a nail. Uh, hopefully, they've got good enough bone that it will hold it fairly well. And uh, most people do very, very well. I have fixed hip fractures on <clears throat> about 15 people that are over 100. The oldest 104 that lived to walk again. <clears throat> so you have osteoporosis. Then you have degenerative diseases. If you see these feet, uh, the more stress we put on our feet and the more we're up walking around, the more susceptible they are to deformity and to uh, uh, problems uh, with the foot. And if you've got bad skin and you have uh, uh, abrasions and you have things that bacteria can come in, you can get osteomyelitis in the foot. This is terribly debilitating disease in people that are diabetic. So the most common site of osteomyelitis in people with diabetes is in the foot. It's a, it's a very common cause of uh, uh, loss of toes and loss of legs. This is a, that previous patient was a diabetic with uh, significant deformities in the foot. This is a diabetic also. <coughs> they, they get, uh, uh, <coughs> diabetes affects the peripheral nervous system. They get uh, uh, some problems with senses of where the ankle is, and, the, uh, and they develop what are known as neurotropic joints or Charcot joints. Uh, and this is what a Charcot joint looks like. That's not a fracture. That's just what a joint looks like. These are very commonly seen in people with diabetes. Uh, they are a common site of infection within the joint, and that can uh, spread to the bone. So that's a common site of osteomyelitis. Infections, <laughs> again, as you uh, age, your immune response is not what it should be, and you're susceptible to infections that <laughs> normally uh, the body would ward uh, with its uh, immune response. This is a uh, patient with uh, gas gangrene. Uh, and you can see this diabetes uh, affects the foot. You can see the air within the joint. This is not a bad organism. Uh, Clostridia is commonly an organism that, that you can deal with. But if you have some immune response associated with aging, uh, 
it can be devastating, deadly. <clears throat> this is a common presentation for osteomyelitis. This was a 75-year-old with good bone who years previously had had uh, an osteomyelitic uh, problem in his proximal tibia. He had not had any problems forever. He developed some pain, swelling, and tenderness in the tibia with this x-ray appearance. Bone scan shows an increased uptake in and around the proximal tibia. So even though he had not had any problems with osteomyelitis for 40 years, uh, it still recurred. This is a slide showing the, the uh, PMN response. <clears throat> this is another 70-year-old. Uh, Again, this is a peculiar presentation for osteomyelitis because it's in the diaphysis. If you see this little rim of uh, tissue elevated from the bone, uh, the uh, metaphysis is infected and it leaks out from the metaphysis and pushes the periosteum or the envelope covering the bone away from it and that's what you see. Although metaphyseal osteo, especially with no trauma, this is a, a man that had no trauma whatsoever. He developed pain in his thigh, so this was a blood-borne uh, osteomyelitis and probably from a dental manipulation. This is the sequela of osteomyelitis. You get a, a dead bone here in the middle and a live bone on the outside. You call the dead bone is called a sequestrum, right there. The live bone that builds on the outside of it is called an involucrum. I've got a much better picture of it on down the line. So, osteomyelitis occurs from trauma, usually to the metaphyseal uh, bone. You get some sludging in here. Some bacteria can build up, and that's what causes the infection. And that's why metaphyseal bone is more commonly uh, associated with osteo. And this is not the osteo that occurs following a surgery. This is osteo that occurs from uh, blood-borne spread. Notice all of these look like happy vertebra. This one doesn't. Osteomyelitis in the spine, disc space osteomyelitis is a, is a very uh, s severe problem, especially again in diabetics. I'll never forget, maybe 15 years ago, I had a medical student brought his mother to see me. And she had back pain and, and no x-ray changes, but she looked, she didn't look well, so I got a some lab studies on her and worked her up and she had a very increased sed rate and she had a blood sugar that was about 300 which is not that high uh, so I called the kid and I said your mom has diabetes uh, she needs to come back and let's take a look at her well she had gone back to her hometown he called her and she kind of neglected it and she had uh, sepsis from uh, disc space infection that occurred several weeks later that probably had its uh, onset about the time that I saw her. So sepsis in, um, uh, from disc space and, and osteomyelitis is not an uncommon thing in diabetics. Again, the vertebrae have a very rich circulation. The disc spaces don't have good circulation. <clears throat> so if it does not have a good circulation <clears throat> and you get some bacteria deposited in here, usually comes from the urinary tract, the bladder, uh, prostate, uh, then this space is not resistant to infection and uh, uh, it can build up anitis in there and, and uh, suppurate and cause an abscess. This is, this is an old case of osteo, an old healed osteo. You see where the, the thickened bone is here. This is called a Brody's abscess. This is a guy that had osteo years and years ago. He comes back with a hot, tender, swollen tibia uh, with this little abscess. You see the little radiolucency if you, 
y'all might be able to see it a little bit better than I can right there in the bone. And that was an itis of osteo from 40 years ago. It's like breast cancer. You know, breast cancer, you can have breast cancer and be free of it for 20 years. Osteo is, is very similar. Now, this is the most common operative presentation of, of uh, osteomyelitis. It's from either surgical implants or total joint replacements. They'll get some loosening around the prosthesis. The bone skin will show some uh, evidence of infection. And there's nothing that you can do other than take the prosthesis out. So that can leave you with a bad uh, limb. Septic joints occur most commonly in the shoulder uh, and in the hip. Uh, if you will look at, see which side. This was a, a diabetic that developed uh, a, a blood spread osteo uh, from uh, subacute bacterial endocarditis affecting both hips, and you see he lost both of his femoral heads. This is an old abscess, again a Brody's abscess. Now, this is a femur. This is my femur here. <coughs> This right here is all sequestrum, so this has no blood supply to it. This was an infected femur. It lost its blood supply, but the envelope around the femur still had blood supply, so essentially it built him a new femur. This is called an involucrum. This is called a sequestrum. Fortunately, we don't see that very much nowadays. This is the sequestrum. It has no blood supply. You have to go in there and take it out. And uh, a humerus, again, this is the sequestrum, and you see how the bone regenerates through the periosteum or the outer circulation. You can go and, and uh, clean that out, and usually the uh, humerus will survive. Another hip. Uh, Usually, you normally have a ball around it like that, and that's uh, uh, another diabetic with, uh, with osteo. Can you turn the lights on? Okay, so <clears throat> osteomyelitis is, is, a, is an uncommon disease in the aged. Hematogenous osteo is an uncommon disease, but it is, <clears throat> It is not a rare disease. Bloodborne uh, pathogens can nestle themselves in the hip, the shoulder, the back, and spread to the bone around it. Uh, pathogens can nest on man made objects such as uh, uh, arthroplasties, uh, nails, uh, and then infect the bone from there. Uh, people with diabetes with uh, poor peripheral circulation are prone to infections in their foot and prone to osteomyelitis in that area. So, in terms of uh, dental procedures and prophylactic coverage for diabetics, would you recommend covering only those diabetics who are not well controlled or or any diabetic at all, or only those who seem to have the peripheral blood supply problem? I think the, in uh, um, our literature supports covering people who have uh, arthroplasties, total joint replacements, right. who have uh, any sort of indwelling device like a pacemaker. Right. Uh, or who have some debilitating problems such as previous heel ulcers, and this is just for a 24 or 48 hour antibiotic coverage. But you would not routinely just cover a diabetic no. to try to no. prevent osteomyelitis? No. Okay. Can you talk a little bit about Fosamex, what it does and who it's appropriate for? No. I can't. I'm sorry. Uh, I don't know much about Fosamax. 
Uh, I know the name, I know the name, but I don't know much about it. There, 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 there's a man in this medical school that's kind of Mr. Osteoporosis, but he doesn't see patients. Uh, and uh, he, uh, in the scientific circles, is, is, is very well respected. And I don't even know what his thoughts are on Fosamax. Yes, ma'am. With a resident with a hip replacement, that it's okay on recovery. She didn't require very much medication for pain, and all of a sudden she has increased the uh, pain medication because of pain. Could you suspect uh, either uh, infection to the site or? The, the incidence of infection following joint replacement is less than 1%. So the, 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 there, there are a number of other causes for pain postoperatively uh, or with uh, joint replacements on down the line. They, uh, so the chance of her being infected is much, much, much less than their chance of, than, than some other cause of the uh, How about with the diabetic? pain. <laughs> Diabetics are certainly much more uh, prone to infection, but still, uh, their chance of having an infection causing pain is much less than something else causing it, either loosening or uh, uh, wear and tear or something like that. Weather also, um, weather? Yep, yep, barometric pressure uh, causes, it's not just a change in temperature, but it's a change in the high or low uh, barometric pressure can cause uh, joint pains of any sort. Certainly can. Well, uh, fortunately, mo most osteo is picked up at a, at a, at a stage now where uh, if you cure it and drain it and treat it with antibiotics, it does, uh, uh, the, the, there is successful cure. If you have a focus of osteo, you can actually take out a large portion of the bone and take uh, your fibula with its blood supply and put it in there and it will uh, hypertrophy for weight bearing. Uh, uh, but if you, uh, the, 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 there are a number of amputations that are done every year at this place for osteomyelitis. So that's still one of the, uh, uh, th 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 that's still a very appropriate and very common treatment for uh, osteo. Any other questions? Dr. Carlin, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank I'm you. Carolyn. We met yes, on the phone. Sure. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay.